All right. So we have Alan Brinkley's The Unfinished Nation. We'll be looking at chapter 19 here. Uh, chapter 19 is called From Crisis to Empire. And this is a chapter that focuses on kind of two separate things. Um, the crisis, in a lot of ways, is the culmination of everything that's been happening during the Gilded Age. And the empire aspect refers to American expansion overseas, otherwise known as or referred to as imperialism. Chapter 19 is also a chapter that talks a little bit about politics. Um, you know, especially in this period of American history, we're not really as concerned with politics as we are with the technological, economic, and kind of um, social transformations that are taking place. We talked about how working conditions change for the working class. We talked previously about the problems of urbanization. So here we'll just mention uh, a little bit when it comes to the politics of the Gilded Age. And there are a couple of things that we can say about Gilded Age politics. Um, first and foremost is that the party system was firmly entre uh, entrenched. Uh, the party system or a party system refers to any point in American history when two political parties really control national politics. And the two parties that we're referring to here in the Gilded Age is still the two political parties that you know, make up the current party system, and that is the Republicans and Democrats. So during the Gilded Age, there was more or less two choices. Now, in regards to um, the types of politics that were practiced between the Republicans and Democrats, um, we're going to point out kind of three uh, features of Gilded Age politics. Um, the first one, or we'll point out two things, actually. Um, the first one is that there was a pretty even divide between Democrats and Republicans. Um, that the average margin of vote that separated these two political parties was 1.5%. We'll say margin. Meaning that elections, especially presidential elections, were very close. Um, we can just think back to um, an earlier chapter in regards to how Reconstruction ended. Um, let us just recall from a previous chapter, the election of 1876, and it was because that election was so close and because there was disputed votes that eventually Reconstruction, uh, Reconstruction came to a conclusion. Uh, the second thing that we can say about Gilded Age politics is that there was an especially high voter turnout, uh, far higher than really most periods in American history. Uh, approximately 78% of eligible voters voted, which is a high number, right? A very high number. Um, with that being said, though, um, the Gilded Age is also a time period where the president uh, kind of takes a back seat in terms of politics when it comes to um, kind of uh, national issues. Um, there are two presidents during the Gilded Age that um, we'll just kind of name here. And they're not really notable so much for their, their contributions. Um, the first one is James Garfield, who we might want to just take note that he became the second president to be assassinated in office. Um, he was shot in the back. Uh, 
And because medical knowledge was rather limited at the time, uh, doctors weren't able to save him. And it's actually believed that the doctors probably even made it worse by trying to save him. Um, political assassination as a tool um, was on the rise, not just in the United States, but um, also around the world. Um, of the, was it five U.S. presidents who have been assassinated? Uh, three of them happened more or less around the Gilded Age. Uh, James Garfield was was one of them. In regards to the issues that were important for the day, um, there was a big debate in regards to what we call civil service um, and the way that the government ought to be staffed. That's what civil service refers to. And there was kind of two ways of staffing the government, that is choosing people to fill government roles and responsibilities. Um, one of them was through ability, and one of them was through patronage, which it kind of refers to like, you know, some sort of, um, you know, like political favor, um, favoritism, more or less. And the type of political patronage, you know, politicians and political leaders choosing just their friends to staff the government um, created a lot of problems. And so there was a back and forth between politicians who wanted to reform the system and politicians who wanted to continue sort of patronage politics. And it wasn't until the Gilded Age that Congress passed a, a law to address this particular issue. The Pendleton Act became the first national civil service. And when you hear the word civil, think civilian. So referring to like serving the people. The first national civil service, we'll say measure. And what it did is that it made it so that certain government jobs required a test. And so this way, simply just choosing one's friends or choosing people who are not really qualified for the job, that at the very least, there would be some sort of qualification that they'd be required to take, um, you know, some sort of exam um, in order for that, that position to be filled. Now, in terms of the types of issues that are addressed politically, there are kind of two things we want to keep in mind in regards to Gilded Age politics. Um, the Gilded Age running up until maybe we'll say 1914. Um, one is that politics during the Gilded Age are corrupt. We might consider this to be the high point of political corruption in American history. Um, the way in which robber barons and corporations were able to influence politics. Um, so there's a lot of favoritism uh, kind of going into that. Um, the second thing that we want to kind of keep in mind here, and perhaps it was alluded to in some of the previous chapters, and it, it might be related to this aspect of corruption, is that for the most part, even though there are laws that are passed and kind of efforts to maybe address some of the problems in Gilded Age society. Um, for the most part, we can say that politics or uh, government is mostly ineffective in, we'll say, addressing uh, citizens' needs. As we'll learn, there are some measures to try and address some of the problems during the Gilded Age. Um, but for the most part, those efforts don't really change much on the ground. Um, there's a reason why in American history we go from, you know, this Gilded Age, and Gilded being like golden on the outside but rotten on the inside, um, to another era called the Progressive Movement. And even though we can see maybe some progressive ideas or progressive laws during the Gilded Age, it's really not until the 1910s, 1920s that many of these uh, issues get addressed. One perfect example of this 
is a law that was passed by Congress in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act. If you'll recall, trusts were ways in which businesses could legally work together to avoid competition. Um, trusts were related to the problems of monopoly. You know, when there's only one industry in town, they can more or less charge whatever price they want and ultimately consumers suffer. So even though individual states could pass antitrust laws, it was very easy for people like John Rockefeller to just move his trust or move his business to a different state um, that didn't have those laws. And so Congress did act in 1890. They passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, which kind of like a law, uh, a lot of laws during the Gilded Age was the first. Right. So this is the first, um, we'll say, national because again, it's happening on a national level, the entire United States, uh, antitrust law. But again, kind of remembering this point here, the reality is that the Sherman Antitrust Act, you know, as a law, didn't really break up any trusts on the ground in a practical way. Um, it failed in some senses. And so it wasn't successful, but it was kind of a, a sign that maybe uh, Congress was attempting to, to act. Another thing in this sort of uh, the similar vein, we're going to skip down here, is the ICC or the Interstate Commerce Commission. Again, one of the big problems being monopoly, there was no monopoly larger than the railroad industry. And while individual states could try and regulate railroads, the railroad industry was so big that in a lot of ways they were more powerful than individual states. And so the ICC was created again as the first uh, federal railroad regulation Oops. regulation. Uh, it said that the prices that the railroad set needed to be quote unquote reasonable and just, right? That they couldn't overcharge citizens for using the railroads. But once again, you know, the ICC wasn't really given that many tools to enact, um, you know, their policies, and railroads were still incredibly powerful. Um, what was more kind of common or, you know, yeah, more common in the Gilded Age, I would say, would be laws that didn't challenge business, but only enhance them. And a great example of the types of laws that enhance the profits of businesses were tariffs. Um, tariffs traditionally are designed to protect American businesses, but during the Gilded Age, American businesses needed no protection. They were doing great. All tariffs did was to tax imports to allow domestic business to profit more. Um, there are certainly ways in which tariffs can be reasonably enacted in order to protect domestic businesses. I mean, that's what they're designed to do. The idea is by taxing imported goods, you're giving your own domestic producers an edge. But the reality during the Gilded Age was that businesses could influence politicians so much so, convince them to tax any imports, thus eliminating, eliminating foreign competition, and with foreign competition eliminated and trusts established in the United States, virtual monopolies, those businesses could then uh, charge as much as they wanted. And so in the eyes of the public during the Gilded Age, any tariff was associated with pro-business policies. And in some ways, somewhat alluding to kind of the corrupt nature of politics and business. Now, the only other president that we're going to mention here is Grover Cleveland. Uh, Grover Cleveland, 
we might just take note of here because he's the only president to have served two non-consecutive terms, which kind of gets back up to the point of exactly how close elections were. So Cleveland was the president for four years, and then he lost the election. And so then he was not president for four years, and then he won the next election, and so he was president again. And he's the only person in American history to go from being president to not president to president once again. Um, he's also one of the very few uh, Democrats to win national office um, following the Civil War, despite the fact of how close um, elections um, you know, were at the time. So again, just in terms of the politics, they're not really the focal point when it comes to the Gilded Age, but some of these things are worth mentioning and some of them are, are worth knowing. Now, to the crisis aspect of it, uh, we focused earlier um, or earlier on a chapter in regards to the conditions that workers faced. And workers face kind of a changing work environment. They faced uh, kind of new developments with technology. Work got more dangerous, lower pay, and workers did several things in order to try and better their condition. Here we're going to talk about the issue with farmers, because in some ways farmers face some similar obstacles to workers. It's also important to note that at this time in the Gilded Age, most Americans are still farmers. Uh, the United States is not yet an agrarian, uh, or sorry, the United States is not yet an urban nation. It's still an agrarian nation. So the agrarian revolt refers to, in some sense, the revolt of the farmers. And we can just kind of list or identify maybe some of the things that farmers were experiencing in this time. Um, so let's just maybe kind of take note of, of a couple of these things. Um, another term for the Gilded Age is the Machine Age. That there was a lot of technological development occurring. Uh, the Second Industrial Revolution, as some people call it. And remember that while technology is great in terms of making production more efficient, and this was true of farmers as well. The technology to you know, use in terms of farming was very expensive. To be a competitive farmer in the Gilded Age meant that one must buy the latest and greatest when it comes to fertilizer, tools, irrigation, um, inventions like steel, electricity, the internal combustion engine. Um, these things make farming more expensive. And so as a result, farmers have to uh, invest more. As a result of that and other things, farmers have to rely on loans from banks, right, to buy all of the technology required. Banks, like most big businesses in the United States, held monopolistic power and could charge farmers whatever interest rates they wanted. Farmers also faced the problem of the railroads. And railroads could, you know, price gouge farmers. As a farmer, you really have no choice but to use the railroads because how else are you going to get your product to the market? How else are you going to sell it? And so both of these industries, the banks and the railroad industry, were really kind of putting farmers in a very difficult place. In fact, at least when it came to the issue of banks, there were a lot of farmers who had their land repossessed. Part of the reason why the ICC was established was because railroads would charge unreasonable and unjust rates. And as a result of several of these factors, including improved technology, improved transportation, crop prices in general fell. Now, we might think to ourselves that falling prices are good, but that's because most of us are kind of consumer-minded. 
you know, we're buyers, we're consumers, so low prices are good. But if you're a producer, if you're a farmer, you want crop prices to be very high. And just like the prices of most material goods went down during the Gilded Age because of the efficiency of production, crops did too. And so that put farmers in a very difficult situation. And so in somewhat of a similar fashion, what farmers decided to do was to band together to try to address some of these grievances. Farmers in the North and the Midwest created organizations called or refer to themselves as the Grangers. And the Grangers attempted to pass Granger laws, right? Granger laws, which would be something like state and local laws. to, you know, regulate things uh, like, you know, things like prices and railroad rates, we'll say. But again, for the most part, state and local laws weren't really effective in being able to regulate huge national industries like the railroad industry. But it was the beginning, right, of farmers coming together to try and, and better their lot. The successor to the Grangers were the Farmers Alliances, which were simply just more maybe formal and widespread organizations for farmers. All right. Farmers' alliances were, in some sense, like unions, right? In the same way that workers formed unions together, farmers formed farmers' alliances. Um, farmers' alliances suffered from some of the same setbacks that unions did. Um, so, for example, there were various divisions within farmers' alliances. Divisions based off of geography, with the memory of the Civil War still in mind, northern and southern farmers' alliances um, were separate from, from one another, and the divisions of race. There were white alliances and black farmers' alliances uh, segregated from one another. And so in a similar fashion, farmers' alliances worked together again to redress many of the problems that farmers faced. But where farmers were different than the workers' party or workers' unions was creating a more formal uh, political movement. Now, it's true the workers did have a socialist party, and the socialist party did represent many of the interests of the uh, workers' unions and, and labor more broadly. Um, but the Socialist Party was less successful. And what many farmers end up creating is the People's Party, also known as, aka the Populist Party. And the People's Party is created to challenge the party system. Right? We sometimes refer to these types of movements, or when we use the term populism more broadly, we sort of just mean of the people. All right, This is a movement of the people. Uh, at the time, both the Democrats and Republicans were uh, really not responsive to the needs of farmers. And so as a result... Um, people just started creating their own political party, the People's Party or the Populist Party. And when it's all said and done, you know, when, when the story is told, you can make an argument that the People's Party is the most successful third party in U.S. history. Um, when it's all said and done, that might be one of the reasons why it's why it's significant. 
So now with a formal political party running candidates more or less on a local level, the populists begin winning some elections. Uh, they start to get political clout. So they're becoming, maybe in the eyes of at least some members of the party system, the Republicans and the Democrats, um, you know, they're becoming uh, more, um, you know, they need to be contended with. Um, so who were the populists? What were the populist constituency? Again, we're mostly talking about the farmers. Uh, really as the backbone of this movement. There were others who would eventually maybe throw their lot in with the populist constituency, but for the most part, this is the rural, this is the agrarian vote, uh, is what we're referring to. Um, some of the ways in which the populace kind of failed um, was to bring in workers. You know, some workers could see common ground with the populace, but not sort of a widespread movement. And something we alluded to earlier, especially in the former con uh, Confederacy, um, was the incorporation of African Americans, segregated um, farmers' alliances, ultimately created a populist movement in which racial resentments remained. And so the populists had a number of different ideas, right? They, they proposed several uh, different changes uh, that would improve things. We'll go ahead and just mention two populist ideas here. Uh, the first one is to have government-owned railroads, sort of similar to the way that the streets today, in which we all drive on with our automobiles or our cars, are owned by the government and maintained by the government, more or less you know, free to use, but tax money goes towards it. Um, it's not a private business. And populists saw the privatization of the railroads and the profit incentive as being a major obstacle to their livelihoods, their ability to get their crops to the market. Government-owned railroads, in some essence, would end the abuse maybe abuse is the wrong word, let's say end the exploitation of, uh, of farmers. Another big issue, which ended up being a, a big issue of the day, was a question over monetary policy, right? Monetary equals money. And again, the, you know, we think about some of the ways in which farmers and the populace are kind of channeling their protests. Here we can see it very clearly aimed at the railroads. When it came to the issue of silver, this was aimed towards the banks. At the time, the United States was on the gold standard. That means that all money that the United States had in circulation was based off of gold, that you could only have so many dollars as there was gold. And this limited the amount of money that was available. Because there was a limited amount of money, that meant that loans were you know, very expensive, right? It was expensive to borrow money. What the populace wanted to do was to include silver in the monetary policy. So rather than basing the US dollar off gold, the populace wanted gold and silver. And this would create more money to be available and the price of borrowing money would go down. And so this became kind of a, a major issue during the Gilded Age just more broadly. Did you favor the gold standard, which was a standard really approved by those that already had money, banks mostly, or did you approve gold and silver, which would increase the amount of money available and was generally favored by people who didn't have a lot of money, right? Because in some sense, you're kind of watering down the, uh, the US currency. And so these are some of the things that the populists are proposing. 
provide some of the policy um, ideas. Now, in the 1890s, the United States experiences an economic downturn, right? The Panic of 1893 is an economic downturn, which, like a lot of recessions and depressions during the Gilded Age, are rather volatile and lead to increased rates of, of unemployment. Um, the economic downturn or the Panic of 1893 led to some semblance of social instability. One example in particular was that of Coxey's army. And this was a group of people, unemployed people, group of people who marched Uh, on Washington, D.C., or on D.C., demanding some sort of public jobs program. All right, so there's a, a growing voice for the government to become more involved. Again, let us just recall from an earlier chapter this notion that really dominated kind of Gilded Age culture, which was social Darwinism. And that was the idea that the economy is like nature and that you shouldn't become involved in it. That in fact, you know, you, the government should not provide some sort of works program. Social Darwinism was mostly something that was supported by those who were already you know, well off economically. And so, you know, movements like Coxey's army government ownership of the railroads, the populist movement, are really kind of ideologies that run counter to social Darwinism. Um, Coxey's army is, is kind of one good example of some of the social upheaval that occurred in the 1890s and, and really in some sense um, the culmination of a lot of problems in American society um, kind of bubbling up during the, the Gilded Age here. Right, golden from the outside, but not so golden from the inside. That not so golden inside is becoming more uh, visible, right? More public. We talked earlier about the the silver question. Those that um, favored the coinage of silver, the quote unquote free silver ad advocates. Remember, these are mostly farmers, or we could say uh, any type of borrower. Right? If you want to borrow money, then that means uh, you, know, you want it to be cheaper. In 1873, a.k.a. the crime of 73, this was when the U.S. Congress, Congress banned coinage of silver. Um, in other words, silver was, before uh, 1873, um, and at various other points in American history, uh, silver could be counted as part of the overall uh, money supply. Um, but really, before then, you know, silver wasn't considered as valuable, and so it really didn't make any difference. Um, so we might also say that this is you know, a, a law that makes it so that it's gold only. And again, those who advocated for the coinage of silver would refer to the crime of 73 as being this injustice that was done to, again, those that were farming and those that sought to borrow. Now, the populist movement um, has success on a local level, and it has the support of farmers. And it does what pretty much any third party can hope to do, and that is to influence one of the um, influence one of the two parties within the party system. The way that our elections are set up with a winner takes all, it makes it very challenging for a third party to compete. It makes it challenging for a third party to win elections. The best that third parties can really hope for is that one of the two major political parties will begin to adopt uh, 
your policies. And that's exactly what happened in the 1896 election. We had William McKinley running for the Republican Party. Uh, William McKinley was kind of your traditional, and by traditional, we mean, you know, sort of pro-tariff, pro-gold um, Republican, right? Like most of your kind of pro-business, social Darwinism type of oriented politicians. And then for the Democrats, they chose William Jennings Bryan, who was an interesting choice because he had adopted populist positions and ideas during the Democratic nomination process when they were choosing who they want to run for president, William Jennings Bryan gave a speech that is probably more synonymous with the populist movement than anything else, and that was the Cross of Gold speech. You can see a political cartoon here with William McKinley holding a cross of gold. And in short, what he said in that speech is that you will not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. That you will not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. You know, gold kind of referring to or being very, very symbolic of the concentrated economic and political power of banks and industry. That mankind won't be sacrificed to the interests of big business. And populists were left with a very difficult choice. During the election, William McKinley didn't really do too much in terms of, you know, giving speeches or promoting his platform. Um, he didn't really even leave his home state of Ohio, but he did have the backing of big business. William Jennings Bryan, on the other hand, gave sometimes five, six speeches a day, traveled throughout the country, and was successful in bringing in many of the populace. In fact, the populist party decided to support Brian, right? Because as a third party, they were left with a choice. Should they continue to run as a third party separate from the Republicans and Democrats? Or do they believe all the rhetoric that Brian is saying? Should they kind of dissolve their own party, or at least not vote for it, and vote for the Democratic Party? And that's exactly what they did. And so the populists ended up throwing all of their support behind Bryan in this election. But unfortunately for the populists, and here we have Bryan, here we have McKinley. Unfortunately for the populists, William McKinley won. And because McKinley won, effectively what this meant was the end of the Populist Party. End of the Populist Party. Which is very revealing because earlier we had said that the Populist Party was perhaps, um, perhaps one of the most successful third parties in American history, and yet within you know, maybe 10 years of its existence, it's already gone. Um, but it did do a couple of things. It captured the Democrats or the Democrats in the 1896 election, and a lot of populist ideas would continue to be part of party, poly, uh, party politics. Um, another thing, though, that we should mention about the populist party is that many of its ideas will influence a movement that has a lot more success nationally, and that is the progressive movement. So for example, one issue that the populace advocated for, that the progressives advocate for, and that actually does become a law, is the idea of a graduated 
progressive income tax. All right, that is a tax on income that the more money you make, the more money you get taxed. That was something that the populists wanted. That's something that the progressives wanted. And it's eventually something that the progressives uh, enacted. Um, that's also not to mention simply just how the term populism still lives on today. Um, you know, that term is still frequently used to describe, um, you know, popular movements, movements of the people, uh, regardless of their really political positions in some ways. So there still are lots of reasons why the populists are significant, uh, despite the fact that the 1896 election more or less made the populist party extinct, right? They no longer existed after that, after that election. For McKinley and his victory, it was, you know, just kind of a confirmation of confirmation and continuation of everything Gilded Age, essentially. Uh, while McKinley was president, he continued to enact tariffs. In fact, these were some of the highest in U.S. history. And helped pass the Gold Standard Act, which more or less was a commitment to gold only. All right, so this was a clear defeat for quote unquote the supporters of free silver. Silver. So in regards to the politics, probably the most important development that we need to know for the Gilded Age is the rise and fall of the populist movement, right? The rise and fall of the populist movement. Very rarely in American history is there a third party that comes along and influences national politics in such a way that the, um, that the, the populist did. So that's the crisis part of this chapter. Um, the, next, the next part of this chapter is empire. And it's in some ways connected to some of the themes that we've been referring to or talking about previously. Um, this period in American history, or not just American history, I should say, this period in just the broader world history is sometimes referred to as the era of imperialism. And imperialism is a term that more or less means like a greater power um, either influencing or maybe like outright taking over a lesser power. Right? Uh, an imperial nation is a nation that exercises influence over lesser nations. Imperialism can come in sort of a lot of different ways and fashions. It could be economic imperialism, political imperialism, cultural imperialism. So it can come in sort of different flavors. Um, imperialism can be in some cases direct, where you know a, a nation in this case, or state, just outright invades and takes over another nation. Or it could be indirect, in which, you know, there's no change in government, but the greater power can exercise, in most cases, economic influence and extract various concessions. Um, this era of imperialism globally had already been going on. In fact, it had been going on even prior to... Um, United States being involved in um, the Civil War. If we had to give the era of imperialism probably a date, we'd probably say something like 1800 to 1914, right? Something along those lines. And during that era, the various industrial powers of the world went out and simply took over areas. Probably the most well known is the British conquest of India, but that's certainly not the only one. Uh, France's conquest of Indochina, aka Vietnam, is maybe another kind of significant um, 
kind of point to make here. Um, we can also refer to other nations like, um, you know, Japan, which was the uh, only other non-European imperial nation, um, if you're including the United States as a European nation. Um, you know, they took over places like uh, Korea, for example. Um, but in these years, 1800 and 1914, a handful of industrial nations, you know, Germany is up here, Belgium, you know, Netherlands, you know, there's, there's several that have the industrial and technological capacity to make the rest of the world uh, kind of bend, bend to their knees, so to speak. The United States is amongst these nations, so we can certainly include the U.S. amongst Britain, France, Japan, Germany, you know, these other countries. Um, but we do have to recall uh, kind of two, two things. The first is that um, much of American imperialism and what imperialism looks like has kind of already been going on in the United States in the form of westward expansion. Right, recall this term manifest destiny, which refers to westward expansion. And so you can say in some sense that American imperialism even predates the Civil War. Whereas, you know, in the 1800s, at least what we talked about in some of the previous chapters, the 1860s, 1870s, that the United States was colonizing places like Nevada the Dakotas, and a lot of those patterns continue onwards, but it's only a change in geographic location. Instead of the settlement, resource extraction, conversion to Christianity, the bringing of technology to the West, instead it's going to bring those things to places like Hawaii or Alaska. You know, the same patterns of westward expansion but simply just happening, happening globally, right? So that's kind of, uh, that's one thing. It's in some essence, essence is just a continuation. Um, the second thing that we can point to, and I think I may have already sort of mentioned this, is that because of the American Civil War, the United States is kind of late to imperialism. By the time the United States begins looking for overseas territories, um, you know, countries like Great Britain have had, you know, maybe like a hundred year head start. Um, some of these other countries like Germany and Japan are, are kind of late to the game as well. But, you know, in terms of global influence, um, the Americans are, are, you know, kind of more active later in the game, so to speak. So American imperialism was motivated by some of the same factors that motivated imperialism in other nations. Um, nationalism was one of them. We use this term Django or Jingos to describe those motivated by sort of a, a type of hypernationalism. You know, especially for those in the United States, or an example of those in the United States would be, you know, those who believe that the more land under American occupation, the better. And they're kind of at the forefront of imperialism, right? This notion that the United States should spread as far as it can. And Django's, even though it's a term we typically associate with American expansionists and American nationalists, there were Jingos in Britain and France and Japan. I mean, there were people within those nations and politicians that were very much influenced by their own national um, or feelings of nationalism. Uh, maybe a, a good example of a Django, um, maybe the most uh, famous one, is uh, Teddy Roosevelt or Theodore Roosevelt. And when we think about American imperialism, if we had to put like one face to American imperialism or say there's one person that personifies it, Teddy Roosevelt would probably fit that bill. He was someone who believed that the United States should uh, expand as far as wide and, and as wide as it could. So nationalism is one of the motivating factors um, behind imperialism. 
Um, we can also kind of allude to some of the things that we had mentioned earlier in regards to expansion of the West, uh, namely the economic benefits. So there's certainly a, an aspect of imperialism based off economics, resource extraction, in the same way that Americans looked for silver and copper and tin um, and buffalo in the West, well, they'll be looking for other economic resources. A third factor of imperialism is more to do with the culture of it and some of the ideas that get passed down from Charles Darwin, um, also related to social Darwinism. Now, remember that uh, Charles Darwin was writing about biology, but people had taken Darwin's ideas applied them to human society, and then were able to justify all sorts of human developments, including imperialism. Social Darwinism said that there were quote-unquote fit and unfit civilizations and races of the world, and that it was the duty or the responsibility of the quote-unquote civilized nations or the fit nations to uplift the rest of the world's people. And by spinning it as not a conquest, but as like a humanitarian mission, that allowed for not just the United States, but many imperial nations to justify their direct takeover of other parts of the world. It's not a conquest if they're there to help. A lot of these ideas behind imperialism are motivated by ideas influenced by social Darwinism and pseudoscience about racial superiority and inferiority. And so oftentimes you'll see notions of imperialism depicted where the industrial nations, in this case, Great Britain here, the United States, are often depicted as adults and the nations in which they conquer are often depicted as children. And the idea is that those other nations can't, um, they can't take care of themselves and so therefore require the guardianship of some sort of outside power. So certainly feelings of national um, and racial superiority also motivated industrial nations to go out and you know, really conquer any territory that they could. So several motivating factors kind of played into the overall you know, goal of imperialism, right? One, there's the money. Two, there's the political or national element. And three, there's the cultural or racial aspect to it. Um, but for all the desires to, you know, to go out and, and take over, um, a lot of it requires the sorts of tools or um, the means to conquer. And so various industrial technology is sometimes referred to as the tools of empire. And these were the things that allowed for the industrial nations to, uh, to conquer. And in fact, the one thing that all of the imperial nations had in common was they had a similar, similar sort of technological level. Uh, there were several different tools of empire, but the one that was maybe the most lacking in the United States as compared to their imperial rivals was a uh, deep water navy and a, um, I want to say an admiral, maybe I'm getting the uh, official title wrong, but an admiral in the United States Navy, Alfred T. Mahan, wrote a book. And in that book, he made the argument that the most powerful countries This is here, the most powerful. Countries. Had. The most powerful Navy. And a lot of American policymakers were influenced by Mahan's idea. Um, including Teddy Roosevelt you know, who had a copy of Mahan's book. And whereas before, you know, at the time of the Civil War, the United States really doesn't have all that sophisticated of a navy. It, it has a navy, but it's mostly there to guard the coastlines of the nation. And so as a result of Mahan, as a result of kind of the Jangos in Congress, 
um, as a result of businesses putting pressure on the United States to uh, kind of further its economic reach, um, the United States begins on a process of modernizing its Navy. So much so that by the year 1900, the U.S. is the third uh, greatest naval power. A third greatest navy. Which was really unprecedented. You know, before the Gilded Age, the United States was, in some sense, kind of a, a irrelevant backwater nation. But because of the economic growth and even the military growth that occurred during the Gilded Age, by the time World War I rolls around in 1914, the United States is amongst the most powerful uh, nations in the world, not just economically, but also militarily. So those are some of the broad uh, kind of um, motives behind imperialism. And, you know, with a... Uh, a modernized Navy, there's really no part of the world that is off limits to the United States. So let's give some examples now of imperialism. And the first one we're going to look at is Hawaii. Hawaii is an island out there in the Pacific Ocean. It is actually a rather kind of strategically located island. It's about halfway across from North America to Asia. And so it makes kind of a, for a very logical naval base. Uh, Hawaii has an indigenous population, but beginning with the age of exploration and especially with the interest in growing sugar there, uh, more and more outsiders are moving to Hawaii in order to take advantage of some of the resources that the island can provide. And so very slowly, Americans begin to exert kind of more and more, not more control, but yeah, maybe more control over Hawaii, but certainly grow their presence. In 1887, the United States makes a treaty with Hawaii to build a naval base. This naval base is called Pearl Harbor, probably, or maybe something that i um, heard before, right? Pearl Harbor, which gives the United States Navy kind of a, a, a prime strategic geographical area in the Pacific Ocean to protect merchant ships or to protect its western coastline. Um, it's an important strategic area. Um, American presence continues to grow in the form of investments in the sugar industry. Um, sugar is a crop that demands a high uh, a price. You know, it's it's high in demand, but you can't really be grown in too many places around the United States, if anywhere. And so, U.S. businesses bought land. in Hawaii to grow sugar. And in fact, the footprint of American business in Hawaii was so great that in fact, the majority of the land and a majority of the infrastructure there came to be owned by American businesses. While the demographics remained relatively low, right? In Hawaii, you know, demographics were maybe anything like Maybe 5% of the population were American. Maybe 20% of the population was from Asia, either China or Japan. Many um, agricultural laborers came from China and Japan to work in the sugar fields in Hawaii. And then 75% may have been the indigenous population there. So even though the actual number of Americans was very low in Hawaii in terms of their wealth, their ownership of the land, their ownership of infrastructure, they had a huge amount of influence. And it wasn't very long that those who were involved in the sugar industry began to ponder or think about ways and alternatives to get around what was you know, certainly a defining feature of the era, and that was tariffs. 
right? Tariffs are taxes on imports. And we might say that, you know, the sugar uh, business leaders, we'll just use that, business leaders, wanted annexation. Annexation means to add. The sugar, sugar business leaders wanted annexation to avoid tariffs. Right. If Hawaii was part of the United States, if the United States added Hawaii, Hawaii would no longer be a foreign entity and would therefore not have to pay the additional taxes. And so sugar planters and business leaders, again, the rich and the powerful, the influential, wanted annexation. However, within the Hawaiian government, uh, Queen Lilokalani assumed the throne. And she was very much an advocate for the native Hawaiian population native Hawaiian population and really governed without too much regard for the interests of the sugar businesses. And this made her, in some senses, an enemy of that business class. In 1893, the planters overthrew the queen and made an appeal to the United States government to annex the islands. They essentially deposed her, uh, made her under house arrest. And when news of this reached Washington, D.C., in fact, there was some hesitation um, on the part of Americans to annex Hawaii. Um, not all really comfortable with the way in which the queen was deposed and how the planters had taken over the island. Um, and in fact, the call for annexation didn't happen until some years later in 1898 as a result of a different political event, but that was the war with Spain. We might say 1898, the U.S. formally added the islands. So just like that, Hawaii became part of the United States and, you know, was one part of the empire or was one piece of the overall American empire. Now, there are a couple of other examples, you know, there's, you know, so for example, Alaska is a territory that is brought within the United States a little bit earlier on, 1860s. Um, islands like the Midway Islands are brought in. Um, this section also mentions Samoa as another territory. So there are kind of bits and pieces of other territories and other islands that are breeding, being brought into the American fold. Um, Hawaii might be a, a noteworthy one because Hawaii does eventually become a state. I believe that doesn't happen into the 1950s, though. It's much more recent. Um, in fact, it might be earlier than that, but um, statehood didn't come uh, for quite some time for Hawaii. But of all the imperial acquisitions, of all of American expansion overseas, um, there is no single incident more important to the development of an American empire than the war with Spain, otherwise referred to as the Spanish-American War. And this is a war that happened in the year 1898, the reason why Hawaii was finally annexed. And it results in several territorial acquisitions. But the war with Spain, when it started, didn't really have much of its origins in empire to begin with. In fact, the war with Spain and the United States um, broke out over the island of Cuba which is an island that is located not too far away from 
the United States. There had been talks about annexing Cuba before the Civil War, but any effort to try and annex Cuba um, were immediately halted by Northerners who didn't want to expand slavery. Now that slavery was abolished, you might say that Americans could entertain the idea of Cuban annexation. However, Cuba had been controlled by Spain and it had been controlled by Spain for a very long time, maybe like 300 years or something. But it wasn't uncommon for the Cubans to revolt against Spanish rule. And in fact, there were several Cuban revolts that occurred, the most recent happening in 1895. Now, the story of Cuban revolt was picked up by American media. And in fact, the stories of the Cuban revolution were very much prevalent in the American media space. Um, much like John Rockefeller built a monopoly for oil refining and Carnegie built a monopoly in steel production, there were certain robber barons of the media Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst were two of the, what we might call media robber barons. And they controlled multiple newspapers throughout the United States. And just like every other business in the country, they were looking primarily to make profit. And the stories about the Cuban revolution were you know, it was sort of one of those events that Americans took in a special, uh, a special interest in and would motivate them to purchase or buy a newspaper. And the style or the way in which these newspapers were written um, was a way in which they tried to sell the most newspapers as possible, sometimes with little regard for the truth. This is referred to as yellow journalism, right? So yellow journalism is a type of journalism that aims... to exaggerate or in some cases just outright lie about news events to sell more newspapers. Um, you know, they have a saying about yellow journalism and that was, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Make a good story first, worry about the truth later. And so they were very sort of exaggerated and, um, uh, you know, kind of entertaining or, or captivating accounts of what was going on in Cuba during this revolution. And many Americans through the media came to sympathize with the Cuban cause. They saw Cubans as being very similar to, um, you know, their American ancestors. The... English colonies revolted against uh, an occupying and tyrannical British king. The Cuban revolutionaries were doing something very similar. You can see in this political cartoon, Uncle Sam protecting Cuba from kind of the threat of Spanish power. And so Americans came to support the Cuban cause. They came to support the Cuban revolution. So much so that even people like Pulitzer and Hearst would often make calls to the president at the time, President McKinley, to have some sort of military intervention. William McKinley, though, who was the president at the time, was the last president to have experienced the Civil War firsthand. And so he knew what the reality of warfare meant, the brutality and the death and destruction. So McKinley was very hesitant on actually taking any action. But when some of the revolution threatened American business interests, he did send the USS Maine, an American battleship, to protect some of the economic interests there. Cuba, too, like Hawaii, had a lot of American business ownership. The USS Maine, when it was sent to Cuba in order to protect American interests, or at least oversee it, it exploded. And in the process, let's say the USS Maine exploded in Cuba, killing 266 Americans. 
And upon its explosion, immediately the yellow press blamed Spain. Spain was blamed. Eventually, it pushed William McKinley to declare war. And just like that, the Spanish-American War was on. So it was the explosion of the USS Maine in Cuba, which killed 266 Americans, that ultimately pushed William McKinley to declare war against Spain. Now, I say Spain was blamed because we know today that the explosion was actually caused by some sort of internal uh, you know, mechanical failure, that this wasn't... Um, you know, Spain attacking it in any way. But the fact that Americans had come to see the Spanish as being tyrannical and an impediment to Cuban independence, um, and because Americans had died, um, the United States moved forward with war. Now, it became very clear to some that this war ought to be fought for the correct purposes. Um, and what that meant was that in an era of imperialism, that this wasn't a war for territorial acquisition, that this wasn't a war to bypass tariffs for those who owned uh, you know, manufacturing facilities in Cuba, that this was a war against Spain to liberate Cuba. And so Congress, in order to kind of keep those things at bay, passed the Teller Amendment. And the Teller Amendment said that at the conclusion of the war, the United States would not, would not, quote unquote, occupy, possess, or control Cuba. That Cuba was to be free and independent, because after all, that's where many Americans came to support the war the Teller Amendment passed. Now, when the war got underway, it was militarily an incredible success for the United States. In fact, Americans referred to it as the quote-unquote splendid little war because the war happened relatively quick. It only took one year, 1898, relatively low uh, death toll. In terms of the statistics, 460 Americans were killed in battle. Uh, approximately 5,000 Americans died of disease. But again, as compared to the um, American Civil War, where some six or 700,000 people died, uh, again, this was little by those standards. So it was quick, it was a low death toll for the American side, and it was a victory. Amongst the battles, maybe one of the more well-known battles was the Battle of San Juan Hill. And, you know, very much being reflective of um, the changes to the United States military, namely the creation of segregated and African-American forces. This was a battle that included white and black soldiers in seg segregated regiments. Now, the war in Cuba was over relatively quickly, and in fact, the Teller Amendment was upheld and Americans did not take over Cuba it was allowed to be a, an independent country. But where most of the controversy emerged was over the Philippines. And this really created kind of the, um, you know, maybe like the heart of the imperialism debate. The Philippines, like Cuba, was a Spanish possession. The Spanish had possessed the Philippines, like Cuba, for some 300 years or so. When the United States went to war with Spain, there was very little talk about 
either American conquest or American annexation of the Philippines. And you might say that it maybe caught a lot of Americans off guard when Theodore Roosevelt, who again, you want to think of Theodore Roosevelt as our jingo, right? Hyper-nationalistic, very supportive of American expansion. At the time, he was the assistant secretary of the Navy. And he ordered George Dewey, who was an admiral of, we'll say, a U.S. fleet uh, in, he was around China. Theodore Roosevelt ordered George Dewey to take an American force and attack Manila, which is the capital city of the Philippines. And George Dewey was successful. Successfully conquered. The Spanish Navy really stood no chance. The Spanish or Spain was not among the imperial powers. And so when the United States successfully invaded Manila and defeated the Spanish there, it kind of brought to the forefront of American policymakers this question of what to do with the Philippines. And this question here would be one that would fuel uh, further debates of imperialism throughout the United States. So military success in Cuba, military success in the Philippines, the United States was winning pretty much on every single front. In Cuba, Teddy Roosevelt resigned. Well, he resigned from his position as the assistant secretary in the Navy and created his own volunteer unit called the Rough Riders. The Rough Riders were, uh, we'll say, an all-volunteer cavalry unit led by Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, that battled in Cuba. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, unlike his um, you know, presidential counterpart, Teddy Roosevelt was someone who was, who was born too young to have participated in the Civil War. So whereas McKinley, who understood the realities of war, was very hesitant, Teddy Roosevelt, who viewed war as kind of this great adventure that was missed out on, warfare as being uh, kind of the arena where one proves their bravery or proves their masculinity, proves their leadership. Roosevelt was not only eager to advocate for American expansion, but was very eager to participate, it, participate in it himself. Um, and so he and his volunteer unit, the Rough Riders, experienced battle firsthand. And with the Spanish collapsing on more or less all fronts, the terms of the armistice were as such. One, Cuba became independent. And that was, you know, a result of the Teller Amendment and what the United States had promised. However, though, the territory that was uh, acquired land acquired, we'll say annexed, included the territories of the Philippines, which became an American possession. It included Puerto Rico and, oops, not Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, and the island of Guam. And so in terms of American expansion overseas, the Spanish-American War as a single event, having been victorious over Spain, adding the Philippines, adding Puerto Rico, adding Guam, this is probably the single most significant territorial expansion on the part of the United States. And again, for many Americans, think about the origins of the conflict. The origins of the conflict had little or nothing to do with the Philippines itself. 
And suddenly the nation was thrust into this debate about whether or not the United States should embark or should engage in empire building. And in fact, there were many people who disagreed with this notion of American imperialism. You can see this, uh, some of these political cartoons here that sort of allude to the fact that Uncle Sam is becoming far too big uh, you know, for his outfits. Here you have the growth of the country from the colonial era into the modern era, but now in its latest iteration, Uncle Sam has grown too fat through its territorial acquisitions. And so there's a very strong anti-imperialist sentiment that broke out in the United States following the acquisition of the Philippines. Um, the Anti-Imperialist League was formed. And there were several reasons as to why Americans opposed imperialism. Right? Why not embark on an empire? Well, one, um, there was the question of morality. Some believed that it was simply just immoral to do so. A uh, second reason was, how did it compare with U.S. values? You know, the United States kind of um, portrays itself as advocating for things like government by the people for the people. Well, what is by the people for the people in terms of American occupation of the Philippines or American occupation of Hawaii? Um, could you be an imperial power and promote democracy at the same time? There were economic reasons. So, for example, people like Samuel Gompers, who was the head of the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, uh, wanted to protect wages at home. Territorial acquisitions could lead to the increase or rise in uh, labor in the United States, which could put pressure downwards. So a lot of unions came to oppose imperialism for the economics or economic aspects that it may have. And then there were those that were concerned with the racial purity of the United States. That many of the US conquests of people who were of non-Anglo backgrounds could diminish the racial purity of the United States. These reasons were born mo more out of um, you know, ideas related to social Darwinism, racial superiority and inferiority, and xenophobia. And so there were a lot of different reasons as to why somebody in the United States might oppose imperialism, ranging from culture to economics to moral to politics. Some other note Noteworthy anti-imperialists include people like Andrew Carnegie, <clears throat> the famous author Mark Twain, and the reformer Jane Addams. Right, we're all opponents of imperialism. But regardless of their voices and their efforts to try and pump the brakes when it came to American expansion, um, they were ultimately defeated. And the United States continued to be an imperial empire. In fact, maybe more so than it was initially. Now, just to kind of wrap things up here, following the Spanish-American War and the promises that the United States had made, um, the United States altered and changed some of its position, positions. Most noteworthy was the Platt Amendment. This was an amendment that permitted further U.S. control over Cuba, right? In some ways, this was maybe like the opposite of the Teller Amendment. So initially, the US Congress made it very clear that Cuba was to be an independent nation. Well, in the years following that, the United States passed the Platt Amendment, which gave the United States further control, control over Cuba's diplomacy, 
control over Cuba's economy and permitted the United States to send troops into Cuba whenever it wanted to. So, you know, if if you're a country and another nation can determine your diplomacy and determine your trade policies and they can send troops into your country whenever they want, how independent are you, really? And the answer is not not very, right? So Cuba's independence was more or less in name only. In the Philippines, the effort by the United States to exercise direct control over there turned violent. And in fact, it was much more violent than the Spanish-American War itself. The United States and the Philippines engaged in war with each other for the next three years or so. Between 1899 and 1902, the United States and those in the Philippines engaged in, you know, on one side, a war of occupation, on the other side, a, a guerrilla war. So we might say a guerrilla. And if you're not familiar with the term guerrilla, guerrilla warfare is a type of warfare that involves things like hit and run tactics. It's different than a conventional war because it involves typically a much weaker military facing off a much stronger military. And so instead of facing the United States kind of on the battlefield by conventional tactics, a guerrilla war is more like hit and run. But this was a guerrilla war against U.S. occupation. And it was far longer and far bloodier than the... Um, than the Spanish-American War. You know, approximately 4,300 American deaths resulted from this. Uh, maybe at least 50,000 Filipino deaths. And some historians estimate that due to the disruption caused by the war, things like displacement, famine, and disease, that it could have had a ripple effect in the Philippines that claimed the lives of maybe up to 2 million people. Um, in some ways, um, you know, this Philippine war is kind of one of the first exercises in American occupation, although you can make arguments that maybe the United States occupied the West, that the conquest of the West and Native Americans was a war of occupation. You could say maybe the Mexican War was an occupation, but kind of in ways that it would... Um, I'll just put it this way. There are a lot of similarities between maybe something like the American War in Vietnam and the American War in Iraq and the American War in Afghanistan and then the American War in the Philippines, even though it happened much, much earlier. Emilio Aguinaldo was the Philippine nationalist leader. He was someone who initially welcomed American involvement, believing that American intervention would lead to the defeat and the ousting of Spanish rule. Aguinaldo wanted a free and independent Philippines. When it became clear that the United States was not there to assist with independence, but was rather there to simply just place themselves as the next imperial power, he was the one who led the rebellion against the U.S. And was quick to point out the contradiction between American values, American principles, of self-government and democracy and liberty and the actions of the United States government. The Philippine War ended when Aguinaldo was captured. Uh, that essentially brought an end to the violence there. Once again, you can see the way in which imperialism is depicted in cartoons of the day. Again, here, um, 
you know, the the idea of others being depicted as children, and it's only the imperial powers that are being portrayed as adults. With the Philippine War coming to a conclusion, the United States then could reap the benefits of their acquisition. And maybe the most important thing that the Philippines brought the United States was um, access into uh, Asian trade, uh, specifically trade with China. Um, so maybe we'll just kind of take note uh, of that somewhere. Um, and so some of their policies following the war, or, or even during the war, were related to the American position in relation to China, including that of the open door policy. The open door policy is a policy that is related to China, and it's created by the U.S., And essentially what it does is it permits imperial powers to quote-unquote freely trade in China. See, China was one of these areas that a lot of nations wanted to kind of influence indirectly. It was too big and too populated to outright take over in the way that you know the United States took over Hawaii or took over the Philippines, actually installing new governments there. None of the imperial nations really wanted to do that because it would be too expensive, but they did want to reap or, or benefit economically. And one of the problems the United States had when it came to China was you know that earlier point that the United States was late to the game. And by the time the U.S. arrived, the imperial powers of the world had already began carving up China into certain spheres of influence. There was also the problem or the possibility that, um, you know, wanting to gain access into China um, could cause a war between the imperial powers. And so the open door policy, on the one hand, would kind of let the U.S. in. And number two would prevent, uh, we might say, imperial conflict. In other words, instead of everybody trying to fight for their own little piece of the pie in China, why not everybody just treat China like it's a, a store with its door open? You know, any of these powers can come in and do business and leave as they, um, as they please. Now, of course, the country that is kind of left out here is China themselves. And in fact, after, you know, a couple, I mean, up until this point, it's probably been, you know, well, they call it uh, a century in China. But, you know, after about 80 years or so of foreign intervention and outside nations taking advantage of China, the Chinese fight back. The Box Rebellion in 19, was it 1900, maybe 1901, is a Chinese rebellion against foreign influence. And in sort of an action that helps explain how the imperial world order was upheld, because one of the things that allows for imperial nations to carve up 85% of global territory is the way in which imperial nations avoided conflict with each other. When the Chinese revolted against foreign influence, all of the nations that were doing business in China banded together, including the United States, in order to put down the rebellion. And so the United States was part of this international coalition to put down the Boxer Rebellion, which it successfully did. And so from that point onwards, again, imperial powers would continue to try and uh, maintain some sort of global dominance while avoiding conflict with each other. Now, that could only last so long. In some ways, you can view the outbreak of World War I in 1914 as those industrial nations finally going to war with each other which 
in many ways, this is kind of the next chapter in, in American history in terms of foreign policy. But this chapter concludes with, um, you know, American intervention in China. And we can see here kind of a, a better bird's eye view of exactly what's transpired. So again, we might think of imperialism as being a continuation of what's already been going on, right? So the United States, for the most part, east of the Mississippi River, with westward expansion, the United States spread further west. And a lot of the same kind of trends or patterns along with imperialism, you could say that the United States colonized or occupied parts of the West. Uh, Frederick Jackson's Turner, um, you know, the, the frontier thesis, 1893, or you could look at the Battle of Wounded Knee in 1890 and say, well, the West had already been settled at that point. And then it was after that, that this process of expansion, you know, nothing's really changed here. It's just continued. The United States annexes Hawaii, 1898. The Midway Islands, the Wake Islands, Guam, Samoa, Philippines, and then over here in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. And so even though when we compare the United States, like we compare it maybe to the British Empire or the French Empire, you know, it's nowhere close in terms of the size and scope of some of the other kind of global imperial powers. But we can certainly say that the United States during the Gilded Age, leading up to the First World War, certainly claimed an imperial empire for themselves. 